Aha, so I think we're actually officially here, Ray. Um, so hello and welcome everyone for joining us for an evening with Samantha Irby and Glennon Doyle. Uh, I'm Rakesh Sathyal and I'm uh, on the vice president, I'm the vice president of the board of Lambda Literary. And I'm thrilled to be your host tonight for this installment of Lambda Literary Does Pride, a series of readings and discussions with a few of our community's brightest stars. To see our full list of events, visit our website at lambdaliterary.org. Books have always been central to queer culture and identity, which is why I am so proud of the work that Lambda Literary does. Many of you might be familiar with the Lambda Literary Awards, which celebrate the best LGBTQ plus books of the year. Since 1989, the Lammies have asserted the distinct value and power of queer literature. The Lammies are just one part of our work, however. Lambda Literary also brings LGBTQ plus books into schools so that kids, especially queer and trans youth, can see themselves reflected in the books they read. Um, and I should say, as somebody who's participated in this program, I love it so much and it is really, really meaningful. Um, we also prepare future generations of queer writers by offering the only writing residency in the world exclusively for emerging LGBTQ writers. These programs and others are only possible because of financial support from people like you, which is why I ask that you make a donation to Lambda Literary tonight by clicking the donate button at the bottom of your screen. Like many people and organizations, the COVID-19 pandemic has had an enormous impact on us. And this June, we need to raise $25,000 to continue our work throughout the year ahead. Please help us ensure that Lambda Literary can continue to respond creatively and powerfully as we move through this tumultuous time. Even giving as little as $10 ensures that we can keep bringing you programs like tonight's in the months and years ahead. You can contribute to our work at any point tonight, again, by clicking the donate button at the bottom of your screen or visiting lambdaliterary.org. And with that, I will introduce tonight's guests. Uh, Samantha Irby is an American comedian and New York Times bestselling author and national treasure on Twitter. Uh, she runs the blog, Bitches Gotta Eat. She's the author of four books, most, re most recently, Wow, No Thank You, an instant bestseller, number one New York Times bestseller. Irby also co-hosted the live little show, Lit show Guts and Glory in Chicago with Keith Ecker until 2015. Glennon Doyle is the author of number one New York Times bestsellers Untamed, a Reese's Book Club selection, and Love Warrior, an Oprah's Book Club selection, as well as the New York Times bestseller Carry On Warrior. An activist and thought leader, Glennon is the founder and president of Together Rising, an all women led nonprofit organization that has revolutionized grassroots philanthropy. So I'm so thrilled to welcome both Samantha Irby and Glennon Doyle to tonight's discussion. Welcome and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing is worse than sitting through your own bio. Um, Incredibly <laughs> embarrassing. I'm already sweating, so that's good. Already um, sweating. Did you get to like meet Oprah when she mm -hmm. picked your book? Yeah, I've been to her Can house. We talk to Oprah for a second. How I'm incredible was Oprah. that? She's just. I actually was a little bit, well, I was very nervous to meet her, but one of the reasons is because I sometimes feel nervous about meeting people that I adore and admire because mm -hmm. I don't know if you've had this experience, but sometimes you meet people that you think are so wonderful and then they suck. <laughs> <laughs> it's like such a let, just heartbreaking, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but she's just like one of those people who is just even more her in person than she mm -hmm. is even in public. She's just good. She's just good. If I met Oprah, I would like, first of all, I would be like covered in flop sweat. Mm -hmm. I would just mm -hmm. be like, you know how like when you sweat so much that your like clothes are like sheer and sticking to you in spots? Like, I would do that. And then if she wanted to talk to me about anything I'd written, I would just like fall over and die probably. So yeah, I'm, that, very that's about right. <laughs> I'm very impressed that you like lived to uh, <laughs> tell the tale of having that. I am too. And Sam, I'd made it through, it was, we, I did a Super Soul Sunday. So we were in our backyard doing the Super oh Soul Sunday. Oh my God. And I felt like we had just like, I made it through. I didn't die. I didn't, you know, I went blank. I have no idea what I said, but I made it through. And then she said, why don't you come in and stay for dinner? Get the fuck out of here. And I was like, oh, but like, I, I, I was like, I just made it. I made it. And now I got a whole nother couple hours that I could screw all this Didn't up. So. Say? Yeah, of course, of course, of course. Of I would have like, see, now I'm gonna reveal that like, 
I'm a dirt bag and you're gonna be sad that you paired up with me. I would like poop in her bathroom <laughs> and like steal a hand soap or like something, right? Just take I'd something. Like, yeah, I'd be like, yeah. well, first of all, is she gonna fucking notice? Second, like, I want to see what kind of like two hundred dollar hand soap yes. she has in her bathroom. That's like the kind of stuff I want to know about people, like any people, but especially like rich people. Is like, what hand soap do you use? Like, yeah. what kind of towels are in your guest bathroom? Um, so I wouldn't have been able to resist that. What did what did she feed you? I don't know. I don't. Remember. You don't remember? Well, there was a person who had been a contestant on Top Chef. That no, you, I, when you're talking about like, oh, I would look in the bathroom for, I wasn't like conscious. I was just trying to make it through and not say anything t stupid. I was just very self-contained and self-conscious is what I think. But she does this oh thing at dinner where you go around and you all say something you're what did we say? I think we all said something we're most grateful for. She does like questions and everybody around the table answers it. It's just, everything was just really beautiful. It's just something. But I, I didn't see any hand so I'm sorry, I didn't think of that. I cannot be, like, I cannot be in a classy place like that. I cannot have a person like her ask me what I'm grateful for. It would definitely be something like dumb. I'd be like, you know, emodium or whatever. It would not yeah. be I, I would want to be like, I'm really grateful for, you know, the this moment and blah, blah, blah. Like, I'd want to say something beautiful, but then I'd just be like, you know, I'm really grateful for, like, two-ply toilet Two paper. <laughs> well, she said like, something. Get out of my house. <laughs> yeah. She said something about, she had been thinking about Nelson Mandela or something that day. So she was talking about, she did her grateful and she was talking about, she said the most beautiful thing about Nelson Mandela and freedom. And my sister was sitting next to Oprah and she goes, oh, she took mine. <laughs> and that was the best part. <laughs> Everybody just cracked up. She's like, what, what the hell do you say after that? That's perfect. Could you imagine being like, having like Nelson Mandela on your mind? I don't right. know if you've <laughs> ever thought about him outside of a classroom in which something about him was being taught. Like my mind is truly like, like cartoon, like monkeys jumping Tell around. Me. Not what, like what has been on your mind today? On Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela. That's a. That's a. I, that feels like a lot of pressure to kind of have smart shit on your mind. I would yeah. never want that. I don't ever want to be thinking about anything other than like TV. So okay, I have a question about your mind. Yes, because my wife and I have actually had this conversation because I've read every single one of your books. My wife listens to the she runs at me and she mm -hmm. listens to the the books and your book is the only book in my home i think i told you this i tweeted this or something that has been stolen from my home several times so i have bought probably three or four or four copies of wound up well, did oprah did oprah steal it no I'm oprah just... did she stole it the first time but no samantha my i have an older teenage son he's 17 and his mm -hmm. friends take them your book is the only book in my family that is cool enough to get stolen by my teenage Jer's friends. That is overwhelming to me. Do you think it's because they think it's for children? Wait, no. you have <laughs> no, no, no. They know you. They know you and they know you're hilarious. Is, that is incredibly uh humbling for me the only thing i ever want to be is cool to us yes. that's what we're all going for uh, and i have never, never made it but you have you know a, a tom cruise who i love could be like sam i think your books are really cool and i'd be like okay mm -hmm. but if like a, a random teen on the street was like Hey, uh, you still have a blog? That's dope. I'd like melt into yes. a blog. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Do they read the books? Because that they don't like crack it open and think like, oh, this old anxious lady is. I hate her. They really uh, no. They might say they might think this old anxious lady, but they don't hate you. They love you, old anxious lady. That's and so, so my question about your mind is: my family and I have had this conversation. And now you get to you. I get to get you to answer it yourself. 
Okay. Is your mind, okay, the way you write. So is your mind actually doing that all the time? Like when you look at a scenario, is that, or is that just the way you write? Or is that actually the way you think? Is that the voice inside your head all day? Is it what I need to know. Is, that is the voice inside my head all day, pretty close. Sometimes the inside voice is quiet, like uh -huh. it is soothed by some sort of, you know, screen in front of it, much uh -huh. like a toddler, it can be settled down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that is like my writing voice is very much like my inner monologue. Like when I sit down to write, um, I say this all the time that I, I write to an ending. So whenever I know I'm going to write about something, I figure out how I'm going to end that thing. And then I get the ending down and I just start wherever. I love taking like a circuitous route to the end of a thing. Um, and then like ending up there and being like, oh, okay, that worked out. But yeah, my general, like the, <laughs> the typewriter in my mind is pretty much exactly what goes on the page. Not as, uh, I mean, it, it then gets like edited and, um, you know, of course, makes, makes sense, but yeah, that <laughs> makes sense. Okay, I have to say one more thing, and then I have a visitor here that wants to say hi. But, um, I love that you I just said you start with the you see a toned arm. Okay, Abby wants to say hi because she loves you so hi! much. Hi, yeah. my favorite Samantha. I know, you love her, she's right there in person. This is incredible. First of all, this is like lesbian dreams. <laughs> <laughs> we agree. Oh my God. And also your books have accompanied me on 70 to 80 miles of runs. Mm -hmm. I love you. I think that you are hilarious. hilarious. Thank you for your work. Keep doing it. Thank you. I'm sorry to pop in and interrupt. But neat and good looking and athletic. Mm -hmm. You can't have all three. You know, but she does. What, what's the missing piece? Are you like secretly poor? What is do you know? What? No, she's not even secretly that. poor. Not e you know what? She does chew ice. Oh, good God. Oh, she I'm does not chew ice. Poor behavior. So that's what I'm saying. I'm trying to tell her. You can't chew ice. No. That's horrifying. This is where I leave you all because I'm perfect. <laughs> this is where I leave you all. Okay, you enjoy. Know, Abby, how is your bread doing? I saw My bread. I Make took a pause bread. because you gotta come closer so they can. Yeah, see. I took a pause because I um, cut the tip of my finger off. She did. Uh, uh, so it's just now healing, and I'm about. I had to put my Levain in the fridge because I was just wasting a ton of flour. I couldn't get in there and do it all. So now I'm I'm on the mend, and bread is about to come back because I love bread. I love that you love bread. I saw that video and I was like, okay, that's my that's my kind of girl. It's pretty much the only reason why I run. Samantha, do you know anyone who just learned how to bake bread? Because the way that you're talking about it makes it seem like it's wonderful and it's not wonderful well, because okay. it's like but, someone who just found CrossFit or veganism or Jesus. They just <laughs> talk about it nonstop. I just had to go gluten-free for my butt and now... <laughs> Eating bread is pointless because gluten-free bread is disgusting. Mm. So seeing someone who can eat gluten, like really get their hands in the gluten is very appealing to me. Oh, it is. It's not painful to you. Okay. No, okay. it isn't. But if I lived with it, I mean, you know, my wife bakes and she got really into making focaccias. Oh. But not less of a process. There are no, it's not like sourdough, which you have to like nurse and all that. It's it's pretty easy. Um, Samantha, I just want to tell you that one day um, I woke up and she was taking her bread for a walk no, around our no, no, yard. No, the Levain, my wild cultures. Whatever. She was taking a bowl of crap <laughs> for a walk around our yard and talking to it. So that's what I want to tell you happens with the bread people. They lose their minds. No, my it wasn't the starter wasn't starting and I needed to get the outdoors in it. Okay. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you mean you had to get the outdoors in it? So essentially what, what sourdough is is um you create your own yeast. 
right? So you create this uh, a mixture of water and dough to legitimately to, to make the bread rise and also creates that sour taste. Um, and sometimes if the starter that you have going isn't really producing enough cultures to then then it won't rise as much it won't be as sour so you actually have to take it outdoors to get the outdoors inside because that's what is making the the chemicals do its thing and there you have it you have officially lost me you know that i do not believe in the outdoors yes <laughs> me neither me neither in, them in practice right but i love that Thank you. you're doing that bye you guys love you show. enjoy your talk Right. Right. I think we should, somebody just said, I think we should, somebody just said, this is awesome, but can you talk about shit? This is our country is shit. So maybe we should at least acknowledge what the hell's going on. Yeah. So I mean, I've been. It's, I. it's so hard. It. Is, I have to say that it's as a black person, like it's not a surprise, you know, like, I think, you know, there's a quote and many people have said it, the like, it's been happening for a long time, but it's the first time it's getting filmed. Um, I think that it is, I mean, it's shocking, but almost like not shocking enough that we collectively watched a murder. Um, and I, I am not smart enough and don't know enough about sociology to like properly, um, like say what that means for us as a society, but it is horrifying and shocking. I'm mm, glad is the wrong word, but I can't think of a better one. I'm glad that everyone has been forced to face a, a thing that I think the black community for a long time has like known it has is happening. Um, but I, it still is like horrifying to me that there was a murder on the news and there's been a murder on the news every night mm -hmm. for weeks. And I am heartened though. And again, it's so tricky to talk about this without, cause I don't want to be like, I'm really glad that people are protesting oh, and showing up cause, because I hate that it happened, but it is like heartening to see people show up and keep showing up and continue to show up in support. Like that is as as like horrible as the the George Floyd murder in particular since we saw it, but also Brianna and everybody else. Um, as horrible as those were, it has been heartening to see this sort of uprising and reckoning that's been happening. And does it feel different to you? Because it feels different. I, I have cautious hope right now if, because something feels different. The protests that I've been to during the last mm -hmm. week are different. Yeah. It feels like everybody is finally showing up. Yeah. I am cautiously optimistic because I understand where we live and the systems that ensure that the same things keep happening no matter who's mm -hmm. in power, right? Like, mm -hmm. if it were just up to us, those of us regular people who like don't pull the levers, I would be super optimistic. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, people in power do what they can to maintain that power and to make sure that the systems that have have that work for them keep working for them. Mm -hmm. So I'm cautiously optimistic. I love that the young people are like fired the fuck up because like that's who we need, you know. Um but yeah it does feel different this time. I mean, when it lasted longer than three days, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Like, well, we're passing fad. Like, people are going to be in the streets every day. I was like, okay. Yeah. And then you see things crumbling. You see statues coming down, and you see 
Uh, see police departments actually saying they're going to redistribute their funds. Like yeah. for, people have been saying defund the police for so long, but I'm telling you, 80% of my friends had never heard that yeah. a week ago. And right. now there's public declarations that it's, in, you know, we'll see. Right. 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 And you, I mean, and you see people like their minds being changed almost in, in real time or people doing research that they, my wife is a social worker in the public schools and mm. has long like advocated for like community-based policing and that kind of stuff. And to see people adopting like i don't know if adopting the ideas but being open to it and being open to having their minds changed is like a breath of fresh air it's like incredibly surprising to me and again i'm gonna keep saying cautiously optimistic because i don't want to like eat my words when a year from now like everything you know if nothing has changed um I don't want to feel bad, <laughs> feel bad because I felt good, but I am like, I am, it does feel like we're making moves this, this and time. So, isn't it, it's precious and interesting and sad that we're so afraid of being hopeful because yeah. well, hope is vulnerable. It's like, yeah. hope is dangerous. It's yeah. like, you want to be like, Okay, wait, wait, what? Wait, is it possible to get? Is it like you? Yeah, it, it feels scary to even open your, open yourself up to the idea of hope. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's hard to even tell someone what you want personally in yes. your own life, right? To like speak to your. Well, this is what would make me happy. This is what I feel like I need for my life to be good. Doing that on a personal level is so hard. Doing anything. I remember when when coronavirus like first came out and they started like shutting states down and the news was very much like okay you are gonna have to depend on your fellow citizens to um you're gonna have to depend on your fellow citizens to make sure that like that we keep the virus contained and i was like oh we have to depend on our neighbors and friends. We're all going to die, right? <laughs> so, like, it's so it's hard when to when you want something for yourself. It's hard to talk about that, but when you want a whole bunch of things to change for people, it's like anything that requires cooperation mm -hmm. is sort of like, oh, can we? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, like a group I'm project by this. Wait, what did you say? It's like having it. Remember the group projects and yes. stuff, how awful yes. those were. There's always somebody who was bossy, somebody who didn't do shit, somebody who did everything wrong. It's like, how can we possibly get anything done? Yeah, yeah. It's and like, I mean, you know, it's we're in a time now where people are saying lots of big things, and you know, someone needs to come in and like hammer out the details, right? And like put the plans together, but it, just having the, just seeing the conversations, because I understand my limitations, right? Like I don't tell anyone what to think or do politically. Like I know what I believe and I try to, like, and I understand like who the experts are, but it's so nice to see the experts saying, well, this is how we solve this and this is how we solve that. And I, I imagine, more and more plans of action are going to come out. And that is very exciting to me. It's, yeah. I mean, I am hopeful. Me I don't ever want to, the thing about like not having hope. And I say this as a person who is like clinically depressed and like taking my brain meds every day. Right. The thing about like not having hope is like, well then why do anything, right? Like why, get up the next day or write the next book or whatever it's like you have to have like a little grain of something otherwise like everything you're doing is is pointless and i always want to feel like what i'm doing is useful in mm -hmm. some way and it, i can't feel useful if i have abandoned all hope so right. so i try to be a little i try to be a little hopeful
Yeah, me too. You know, well, whatever, that whatever that. That. <laughs> that. Uh, Actually, hello, it's Rakesh again, everybody. Hi, I'm of the Literary. Um, I think this is a good segue to our questions because one of the questions we got was for you, Glennon, about how you look at the practice of hope right now within this mm. context. What does that look like to you? Well, I feel that there, I mean, for me, I, I think that hope is an energy, right? Like hope is, sometimes I feel like not having hope is just an excuse not to show up or do anything. It's like, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I, I don't really put a lot of faith in whether people say they are hopeful or not, but I know that the people who are showing up on all the actions that I'm involved in right now, that the people who are showing up in the streets, that is hope to me. Like, I feel like hope, where your what your hands are doing and what your feet are doing, that is proof of whether you're a hopeful person or not, right? So, um, so I don't know about the feeling, but I do know that I'm in love with people who are acting on hope right now. That's where I'm finding all of my energy. That's where I'm finding all of my, um, just my agenda for the day. Like literally what I do during the day is find the people who are moving in hope and join them. Because even if it doesn't work, even if none of this shit works, even if <laughs> all of it, just like everybody does stop showing up, I, that, I, I still want to be with the hopeful ones who are showing mm -hmm. up regardless of, of end result. And Sam, do you have, is that the same thing too, that you're just finding these, the people and organizations that are kind of putting that idea forth and being there for each other? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, like I was saying, it's easy to like sort of succumb to the bad feelings, but I, but once you get down in there, then it becomes a point of like, well, what's the point? And so I never want to get there and I do, try to pay attention to and like i'm not the most vocal like i tend to stay in my lane but i do pay attention to the people and feel inspired by the people who are like well this can work if we do this and this can work if we do that and this is how we take care of this you know yeah. are, are there particular people you're following online that you really feel that way about like you feel that are kind of this intersection of being a resource and being kind of hopeful and you know, being there for people? Well, see, now I'm gonna, of course, like only think of like meme accounts that I follow. <laughs> I have to circle back and give you some. <laughs> Samantha, we all need hopeful memes. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like mm, the real, real housewives memes. Um, <laughs> I will circle back and give you hopeful accounts to follow that aren't like the dodo or whatever. <laughs> Um, one of the questions we got, which I love this question, which is, if you each had to title a book by the other, what would you title it? Oh, <laughs> oh my God. Thank you. Okay. I don't, I don't know. That's a, I, that is a too creative of a question for 8.30 p.m. <laughs> but I do want to say something, Samantha, about your writing. I would like to take this opportunity to not answer that question and to say what I want to say. <laughs> Um, I knew that you did that with your writing. I knew you started with the end. I knew it. I knew it. I knew that you had, because it's like, oh, this is so funny. The whole way through, I'm peeing in my pants. I'm laughing. I'm laughing. I'm screaming. I'm getting here again. I got to read you another paragraph. Sit down. Sit down. I'm blurring out every other third word. If there's a 12-year-old in the room, I'm peeing. I'm peeing. And then the last sentence is like, bam. Oh, that's what we were freaking talking about that whole time. Damn. Yeah. That's my one trick. I'm a one trick pony. It's a great trick. And I'm just that so is my one trick. If I had to title one of Glennon's oh, answer. Okay. I mean, I'm just gonna name the book I want her to write, which is like Hot Gay Mom. And I want it just to be like a sex book. <laughs> That's amazing. Do you know? Okay, pause, pause on that. I had a sex chapter in Untamed, okay? Uh -huh. But I, because I wanted that sex chapter. Listen to me. I have, I'm 44 years old. It mm -hmm. took me 44 years old to have sex I enjoyed, okay? Mm -hmm. And it was going in the damn book, okay? Mm -hmm. Best day of my life, going in the book. But my wife is very private. So, Sam, 
I wrote that chapter with fear and trembling. I was, I was like, how am I going to write this in a way that will not make her cry and freak out, but will be honoring of this thing. And I have never been so nervous as when I passed that over to her at the kitchen table and she read it and she was like giddy. She was like, <laughs> I love it. I love it. So that was, so, so, but what I'm saying is I will work on having an entire book dedicated to the yes. Called uh, Hot Mom. Yes. Or my my yeah. wife is very private. It also is also a title you could give that. Book. <laughs> <laughs> my wife is very private. But I'm a hot mom. So. My wife is very. I mean, yeah. So you work on that. If you need me to like ghost write a couple of chapters, yeah. <laughs> if it feels too, you know, like too much, I'm here for you. Thank you, Sam. I'm between projects, so. Yeah, what are, what, between projects. Are you working on anything? I'm not uh, well, doing anything, so well, I just I want like to say no. I feel like when you do what we do, you're kind of always working on something. So my, you know, my agent, I'm sure, is ready for me to give him a list of my ideas. We've talked, we've talked about it. I basically want to just like write on a napkin you know what i do and give it to an editor and be like do you do you want to buy that <laughs> like you know you know what it's gonna, it's, gonna be the same, it's gonna be the same thing but like a little different maybe a little better because i'm a little older so yeah i'm sort of working on a new essay i'm putting some ideas together um and then i'm working on a novel which we'll see how that goes. We'll see. That's so we'll see exciting. That and then, but in non-book work, um, I'm currently working on the new season of Tuca and Birdie. So, so I have a, a little side, a little side job between is it, book job. Is it true that you, I know? I read your books. I know every. I know you wrote on Shrill. But is it true that you were in charge of the pool party episode? Well, so I wrote it in charge feels like whatever you wrote it you wrote more it. than I did. But yeah, I wrote it. My name, if you watch all the way through my name, comes at the end. Brilliant. Just which brilliant. Is a very good feeling. And I'm in the episode. If you, <gasps> if you watch the party uh -huh. and you know what I look like, okay, I'll watch you, can, you can see me at the party. <laughs> That's that was Easter egg for everybody. That was my favorite episode of that that show. Oh, no. Me too, um, for sure. For so sure. good. Um, another question we got to the point you were just talking about, Sam. Somebody wanted to know if you ever studied formal essay writing, or if it's really this 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 instinct you're talking about is something that came to you and that you pursued it. No, babe. I uh, went to high school, and then I went to college for one year and dropped out. And then I uh, had a blog for a million years while working a desk job. I have studied absolutely nothing. Once I did like a talk with some like Northwestern MFA students and like, they were like, you know, what's your best advice? And I was like, drop out. You don't have to do this to write a book. And the professor was mad. Not happy. <laughs> but no, no formal training. You too could do this. You do not have to, you don't have to do shit. <laughs> I mean, write a blog for 10 years for free. And like, I also did that. I also did that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But if, if you can do that, then you can write a book too. Um, I have a question just because it's relevant. Um, during our last event, we talked about this, and I'm curious in both of your cases, that a lot of the people you know, who engage with Lambda as an organization are younger people who are finding themselves in books. And I'm curious to know if there are like, books that either you read when you were younger or books that you're discovering now in which you feel like you're getting that experience, that it's showing you the world in a way that feels reflective of how you think and feel. Because um, definitely when we do our Writers in Schools program, like that's one of the things we really try to do is connect them with books that are actually going to help widen you know, their worldview and, and what they make the world. So I'm just curious to know if there are any examples that come to mind for you. I mean, I've, that's all I've done my whole life is find myself in books. That's the only mm -hmm. thing. That, I mean, I was in socially anxious um, mm -hmm. 
clinically depressed, anxious person. This is a, a theme with the writers you have on your show, probably, and all writers. Um, so all I've done my entire life is find myself inside of books. So that question is, I, I feel like um, books are the place where you can get to know people without having to deal with people. Right, <laughs> for people who love humanity deeply, but for whom human beings are tricky, like this is the book. Books are where you do it, right? So always yep. is the answer for me. Yep. Yeah, I I read a lot of fiction. Like that is my because when I read nonfiction, like I have read Glennon's books, but I view those as like helpful. To me, if I read nonfiction that is similar to what I do, it makes me feel like a not good writer. So I don't. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I just am like, oh, uh, this isn't teaching me how to be a better person. And they also make jokes. <laughs> Bye. Um, <laughs> but I read a lot of fiction and it's so. I love to get, I just read All Adults Here by oh, I just read it too. Oh, and I love to like, deep into the family of it all, like deep into someone else's whole thing and their sibling relationships and their parental relationships. So I love like escaping into a book. If I read too many things that are too much like me, I get like, this person like know know all of my my insecurities and flaws. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, yeah. I love to I love to escape into someone else's like created world. Also, world building is so hard mm -hmm. that it's like incredible to me that people can do it. Mm -hmm. You know, like create a whole universe that feels real. Like that's. Mm -hmm. That's my magic. magic. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, absolutely. I think you know, it's our last event we did was actually with Wilson Cruz, and it was amazing because he read from he did a reading from James Baldwin, from um, James Baldwin, um, oh, and and he talked Baldwin. about how he discovered Baldwin through a lot of his queer friends when he was younger, and then he actually reread the books. The, the, the Baldwin's work to prepare for the reading. And it was really amazing to hear him read it. I actually told him afterwards, you need to start narrating audiobooks because mm -hmm. he was so good at doing it. And I think you might, mm -hmm. I actually might end up having him do that. But um, but I think that's right. Like you you connect with a certain thing and you see it reflected that way. And then it has a bearing on the way that you approach the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm curious if um, in this moment, um, like, since the two of you are paired together and you're discussing together, like if there are specific things about your work, you've talked about this a little bit, but things about each other's work that you really feel like in this moment are the things that are getting you through what's going on. Well, so Glennon has this sort of relentless positivity that I find, like I listened to both Love Warrior and Untamed. I mean, I bought them, but then I listened to them too. Um, and sort of having someone, first of all, you are very soothing to listen to, <laughs> but to listen to someone like sort of, I mean, her life changed so drastically, um, and she is very good at like, kind of, I don't know what the right word is but like pulling back from that and talking about it and using herself as an example of like how you can change and how to kind of weather change and find new things out about yourself um and it's like she's infectious you know it's just because i'm not necessarily a like positive person <laughs> um but listening to her is like incredibly uplifting i do while i while i like read or listen to glennon's work i often think like oh so many people come to her for advice and guidance or use her as a guiding light and the pressure of that has to feel insane but she's so good at making you feel good and like hopeful and positive and that is a gift that was a lot Yay. of work. <laughs> Thank you. Be beautifully and phrased. Of course, yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think that 
Sam's work will continue. It's what it's been doing. I'm sure it's doing more of in quarantine. I'm sure the reason why um, her books did so well during quarantine is because it, what Sam gives us is escapism, but it's not. It's the best kind because it's like <laughs> tricks you. Like you're like, oh, I'm just being entertained. I'm just being entertained. Oh, damn. Like that thing that she does at the end where, where, but, but it wasn't, you know, sometimes with nonfiction, it's like, I mean, no offense, but like, it's like, it's like broccoli the whole way through, right? <laughs> yeah. so Sam, Sam, it's like just a little bit of broccoli just covered in chocolate. <laughs> so you're still getting your vitamins, but it tastes good the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> well, chocolate and broccoli are not. My, all right. I'm you calling the next, I'm calling the next book chocolate and broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that's perfect because your book is brown and green, so apparently it, it brings those two things together. Um, yes. So, so we're nearing our the ending of our event, but I just wanted to put it to you if there's any any last words you had for people before um, we wrap up um, that just about the world or books or whatever you'd like to share. Well, I have some words. Read books. Not enough people read. I could go off on a whole thing about that. A lot of people pretend to read <laughs> like they don't actually read. So read. Start with our books. Have a little chocolate broccoli from me and a little sunshine from Glennon. I wore a sun shirt. You can that for you. Um, as far as the state of the world, I would say that some of us have to be hopeful. There will always be doomsday people and that's fine. There's a there's a chair for every butt, a seat for every butt, whatever that phrase is. Um, but some of us have to like try to spread joy and have joy and be hopeful. So try to be one of those. Yeah, be one of those, what she said. <laughs> uh, well, um, thank you both so much. I have to say, as somebody who works in publishing, it's so inspiring to me to see how people connect with your books. And to, to, it just feels, in this moment we're going through, it feels especially heartening to see your work so meaningfully received and so meaningfully put together. And so I just, it's, it really, really moves me if that's the case. And so people out there, please buy um, Sam and Glennon's books. We're actually, any uh, the portion of books sold tonight through Women's, Women and Children's First Bookstore, there's a link on the event page. A portion of the, those um, sales will go to Lambda. So please go to lambdaliterary.org and donate to the organization. Um, and thank you so much to both of you again and sending you hope and positivity and, and sunshine. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good, Good night, night everybody. everybody. Bye. <laughs>